we're going to be focusing this afternoon about the problem of behavior change and uh, what is normally referred to as compliance uh, with uh, policies of government. And you can think about, you can apply these concepts either to uh, individuals or to businesses. Uh, in my presentation this afternoon, I'm going to be focusing mostly, not entirely, but mostly uh, on individuals. At the end of the presentation is uh, uh, an, an application of this to businesses. And I'm not going to go over it in my talk just because I'd be talking all day and I want to be able to get to the cases. So uh, we're going to be thinking about uh, behavior change uh, with a focus uh, on combating corruption because I know that that's something that's of particular interest to many people uh, in this audience. <clears throat> so the starting point for uh, a behavioral uh, approach to promoting development is, as I said in the last session, most government policies aren't self-implementing. So we talked about some of the problems that may arise during the implementation process. Uh, but for many policies, it's actually the public who have to change their behavior in order for the policy to work. So for example, if you want to reduce traffic deaths in Thailand, more people have to wear motorcycle helmets. Uh, it would probably help if you didn't have six people riding on that motorcycle in the picture there, too. Uh, uh, none of them, of course, wearing motorcycle helmets. Uh, if you want to improve uh, 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 community sanitation, then using community latrines uh, to uh, uh, for defecation rather than open defecation, uh, a problem in many parts of the developing world, but especially uh, in India, is uh, a behavior change that you need to promote. Vaccination of children, sending children to school rather than having them uh, engage in work to improve child health and human capital development are clearly behaviors that are an important part of the development process. If you want uh, uh, an environment which is uh, cleaner and sustainable development, then you have to convince people and businesses uh, not to engage in illegal land burning uh, and logging in, in order to meet those goals. Other sorts of behaviors you need to change? paying taxes to ensure that government has adequate revenues in order to uh, meet its objectives, <coughs> not paying bribes uh, to government officials. So all of these are behaviors at the individual level where governments have often very ambitious objectives uh, about changing, changing behavior. Uh, compliance by business, changing the behavior of business is also critical for achieving many governmental uh, goals obeying environmental laws, not polluting, obeying workplace safety and minimum wage laws, obeying road safety laws. Clearly, I think uh, the bus company at the, in the top picture there is uh, probably exceeding vehicle requirements. Uh, obeying building codes so that uh, buildings that you have put up uh, do not topple over. This is a, a case in China. Uh, obeying quality control rules in food production, especially in dairy production. Many of you are familiar with the uh, Sanlu uh, and the broader uh, milk, uh, tainted milk scandal in uh, China that occurred in 2008. Complying with child labor laws. Well, oftentimes there is a big gap between official policy and the reality on the ground. Uh, this picture says, Ministry of Lands, Ministry of Housing, our offices are now a corrupt free zone. I think that any place that declares that it's a corrupt free zone, you can probably guess is not. Um, so uh, obviously, non-compliant uh, behaviors by 
politicians by bureaucrats can have some important implications for development. So uh, corruption can uh, inhibit and skew foreign investment. This is an editorial cartoon from the Philippines arguing that it's been held back by corruption. Uh, informality uh, in enterprises, something we'll be talking about with the Medellin case later this afternoon, uh, also harms uh, investment because small informal enterprises have uh, difficulty uh, accumulating uh, significant capital to make uh, investments. Uh, theft of utility services uh, remo uh, removes government revenues that are needed to finance service expansion, service improvement, uh, as we saw in the case of Hyderabad. So governments in many areas for both individuals and businesses are concerned about increasing government compliance. Uh, or increasing compliance with, with government policies. But what do I mean by compliance? Well, it actually is a, both a simple and a complex issue. On the, uh, on the one hand, uh, my definition is going to be fairly simple, that uh, compliance is behavior that's consistent with government preferences that have at least been clearly articulated. Government has said, this is what we want you to do. Oftentimes, they're not uh, very well communicated. Uh, and by compliance, I simply mean, do the actions fit with government policies, uh, even if they're, whether they're willing or grudging uh, or coerced. But obviously, if they're uh, coerced, then uh, the, um, uh, the costs of enforcement are likely to be substantially higher. But so I said, in that sense, it's a fairly simple definition. Uh, but it's also pretty complex, because government isn't always so clear about what it wants from its citizens or wants from its businesses. Sometimes government is quite insistent, quite intrusive uh, about uh, uh, the expectations that it has of citizens. So don't take weapons on airplanes, right? Government is quite insistent and intrusive. And what's the compliance rate that government wants? It's not 99.9% or not 99.999%, it's 100%. And to get that, they're very insistent and very intrusive. Most other areas, they aren't quite that intrusive, but uh, there are other policies where you can say that you know, the intrusiveness and expectations are pretty high. Vaccinating children, sending children to school, paying taxes, all those are areas where uh, government is pretty insistent. Uh, there are other areas, though, where I think you'd say government's uh, expectations, uh, it's the intrusiveness of the mechanisms that it gets to uh, achieve its objectives are uh, uh, lower. You might call them moderate. So things like wearing motorcycle helmets. Most governments have laws saying that you should do it. Most governments, especially in the developing world, don't enforce it. Uh, very effectively. Uh, using sanitary toilets or latrines is another area where you might say is moderate. And, and then there are areas where uh, government may say, well, we'd like you to do this, but it really doesn't have very clear uh, policies to get you there. Things like feeding children uh, a healthy diet. So uh, big questions we're going to be talking about are why do program targets sometimes behave the way that governments uh, uh, and program designers want what I'll call compliance, uh, and sometimes fail to do so. So, what are the? How do we explain these differences? And what are the various strategies that government can use to try to achieve its objectives? Uh, so, for example, in terms of variation in compliance, you know, if we just look at the Asia Pacific countries, they vary enormously in terms of the size of their informal sector with the informal sector in Singapore estimated about 13% of the economy, in Thailand more than half of the economy. Also tremendous variations in corruption, again looking at the Asia Pacific uh, region uh, with New Zealand and Singapore uh, both uh, being rated uh, very highly in terms of uh, clean government by uh, Transparency International and uh, countries like Laos and Myanmar down near the bottom. Uh, another question you can ask is, even though most governments have made clear that they want people to stop smoking, people continue to smoke, uh, even after they've been exposed to uh, graphic uh, uh, anti-smoking campaigns. And in some countries, tax evasion is clearly 
endemic, but again, much more in some countries uh, than in others. This is a, a graphic from uh, the Guardian uh, listing the number of people who declare incomes of less than 20,000 euros a year, uh, and 188,000 of them uh, own uh, BMWs, Ferraris, Mercedes, etc. 518 of them own private planes and helicopters, 42,000 of them own yachts. I think that's probably a fairly generous definition of yachts, but still, that's a lot of sizable boats to be owned by people who declare an annual income of less than 20,000 euros a year. Uh, another uh, area to think about compliance in is gender ratios at birth, a serious problem, and uh, particularly in countries like uh, China uh, and India, where again we see gender ratios at birth that are very highly skewed in some societies, uh, but not in others. Uh, and uh, governments in both China and India have enacted policies uh, that uh, are attempt to uh, uh, put a damper on uh, uh, gender selective abortion. Uh, but of course, in both countries, it's, Ill it's legal to have the prenatal testing, it's legal to have the uh, abortions, it's just not legal to convey the information about the gender uh, of the fetus. And I'm going to talk about that uh, a little later as a monitoring problem uh, that interferes with uh, the ability to get compliance. So governments, international financial institutions, all sorts of actors want to know how can we get people to behave. This is three recent reports. Of course, you're familiar with the World Bank report, another one from the OECD, uh, a third one that just came out from uh, the European Union. So the core arguments I'm going to be making in this talk are, first of all, we need to think about uh, a variety of barriers that keep individuals and businesses uh, from uh, complying. Uh, behavioral economics has focused on informational barriers and cognitive barriers, and clearly those are important, but I'm going to argue you need to think beyond that set of barriers uh, to a, a broader set of uh, barriers to understanding why individuals and businesses don't comply. Uh, second general argument is that for most policies, the target populations of those policies uh, are heterogeneous. Okay, They have different characteristics, and therefore they're not going to all respond to any set of policies in the same sort of way. And that target heterogeneity uh, is an important contributor to uh, non-compliance. Uh, uh, third major argument is that there are a variety of instruments that governments can use to uh, try to address problems of non-compliance, and that what governments and those who are trying to help them need to figure out is what's the appropriate instruments to use and what are the best settings on those instruments to get an acceptable rate of compliance. Okay, so uh, that's kind of a general introduction. So think in particular about multiple barriers, think about heterogeneous target populations, think about several different instruments that can be used. So let me uh, go through those uh, in a little bit uh, more detail. So why don't firms and individuals comply with government policies? I'm going to talk about uh, eight different sources of compliance uh, gaps, or what you might call eight barriers to compliance. And these can be divided uh, into uh, three kind of broad sets of categories. One has to do with beliefs. Uh, one has to do with an economic calculus, uh, don't need to comply. And the third has to do with capacity. The target population may want to comply, uh, but uh, they're unable uh, to do so. So let me go through uh, uh, the eight barriers divided into those three categories fairly quickly. Uh, a first uh, set of, uh, a first explanation, first potential barrier to compliance is what can be called uh, cognition and information barriers. Targets may lack the information that would make compliance more likely. So this is an advertisement uh, from the early days of the, uh, the Thai uh, campaign against the spread of HIV. And uh, they uh, thought that in many cases, people simply don't know how HIV is spread, uh, what safe behaviors are, and what unsafe behaviors are. And so in a 
relatively graphic, uh, but still stick figure -y kind of way, uh, they tried to convey uh, that uh, information. So that's a simple lack of information. But as behavioral economics has uh, shown us, uh, we also have lots of uh, uh, biases in the way that we process information, and this has behavioral consequences. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, so I'm not going to dwell on it, but you know, the fact that uh, we have both an automatic system and uh, a reflective system, an automatic system, uh, is, uh, uh, it tells us to do things without us really thinking about it. A reflective system, we have to stop. As Daniel Kahneman said, it's a slower system rather than a faster system, uh, but usually produces better uh, decisions, but the automatic uh, system requires less brain capacity uh, and uh, does it rather, uh, does it faster. We, uh, uh, in, we have anchoring effects, we have rules, we use rules of thumb, we tend to be more sensitive to information that we've gotten recently. Uh, so for example, if there's been a recent tsunami, we worry more about tsunamis uh, than uh, when there hasn't been a tsunami, even if we live in places like Washington, D.C., where the tsunami risk is likely to be somewhat less than zero. Uh, and uh, this can lead to uh, uh, leads individuals to uh, uh, have certain biases in the way we make decisions. So again, we act on the basis of inertia. Uh, we uh, rely heavily on uh, default options, that is to say, uh, uh, what happens if we don't uh, uh, make an act of choice, which most of us don't do. Uh, and we particularly tend to rely on defaults if uh, there are lots of alternatives, the default option appears to be acceptable, and it costs a lot to gather information. A classic example uh, is for academics, for example, uh, who uh, make decisions when they take a job with a university. Uh, they can usually revise their retirement uh, investment decisions every year if they want to, uh, and the most common modal number of times that people change their allocation of funds uh, is zero. That is to say, we could change every year, but we say, eh, I'll do it later. Uh, so uh, uh, what sorts of things do we do? We follow the herd, we procrastinate, we're myopic. That is to say, uh, we discount future costs and benefits severely uh, relative to those uh, that are in the present. Uh, so we may say, uh, oh, gee, I'm really concerned about my weight, but that donut looks really good, so I'll start my diet uh, tomorrow. And we're loss averse. Uh, we're more sensitive to losses than to, uh, to gains. Okay, so again, this is uh, uh, familiar to uh, all of you, I'm sure. That's why I'm not uh, dwelling on it here. Uh, but let's just think about some applications of this to one particular area, uh, which is fighting uh, corruption. So uh, what are some of the ways that information and cognition barriers can uh, uh, affect uh, government efforts to, uh, to reduce corruption. Well, bribe payers, uh, for example, uh, don't uh, often know the rights that they have to services, that they're entitled to have services uh, uh, for free. Let's say, let's say getting drugs in a hospital. Uh, bribe payers may not know the true cost of fines. So in India, for example, uh, my son, who's a development economist, worked uh, on an experiment uh, where uh, police were saying, well, you can either uh, pay uh, the fine or you can just give me 200 rupees. Uh, and most people said, well, I'll give you 200 rupees, not realizing that the fine was in fact only 50 rupees. Uh, so there are information asymmetries. Uh, bribe payers uh, often don't know how to uh, report solicitation of bribes or uh, do so in a way that's safe. Uh, and you know, in general, they're uh, afraid to take the risk of not paying bribes because there's uncertainty about what the consequences will be. So again, information and cognition barriers uh, play across all behaviors and are a, a major contributor to uh, uh, lack of compliance. Uh, a second kind of barrier are attitudes and objectives uh, barriers. And these, again, can take several different forms. Uh, one very common barrier, particularly in uh, developing countries, is uh, policy targets are very hostile uh, toward or mistrust uh, uh, government 
agencies, uh, government programs. So take the example of in the early uh, 2000s, uh, uh, the uh, breakdown of the polio vaccination campaign in northern Nigeria, which had very complex roots. But one of the, uh, uh, the causes of it was uh, a mistrust uh, of government. Uh, in many cases, uh, individuals may feel that a policy is being unfairly or unjustly uh, applied to them. Uh, so think about in the United States, uh, the uh, uh, perception on the part of many minority communities that the police are unfairly uh, applying uh, laws uh, to them. Uh, third kind of attitudes and uh, beliefs uh, root of non-compliance is uh, the policy that government has put in place may conflict with deeply held beliefs. And here, uh, the uh, strong preference for sons in some societies, which also, of course, has roots in incentives, the belief that it is more economically uh, worthwhile to have sons and daughters, uh, has led in, in some societies to uh, both female in infanticide and to uh, uh, illegal gender selective uh, abortion. Uh, and again, uh, Attitudes and beliefs may play a role in uh, contributing to corruption. For example, that offering gifts uh, to service providers may be acceptable in some cultures uh, and not acceptable in, in others. Uh, a third sort of barrier in, uh, uh, that fits in with this general category uh, of uh, information and beliefs uh, has to do with peer effects. And a lot of research on this has been done by social psychologists uh, like Robert Cialdini. Uh, and the idea is that uh, individuals are less likely to comply where compliance by others, uh, what's often referred to as the descriptive norm, uh, seems low. So for example, if you're living in a society where nobody else pays taxes, why should I? Or everybody else takes or pays bribes, why shouldn't I? Uh, it, uh, because you're sort of seen as foolish in this situation. If you don't uh, do what other people are doing, you're putting yourself uh, in a, uh, at a disadvantage. Again, an application to corruption, uh, the widespread uh, perception in, in uh, uh, many countries that corruption is uh, endemic uh, and uh, that if you don't engage in it, it's likely to be costly to you, uh, uh, tends to fuel corruption. Okay, so we have this first uh, category, which has to do with basically information and beliefs. So uh, uh, information and cognition, attitudes and beliefs, and thirdly, peer effects. But there's uh, a second category uh, that is a little closer to the concerns of traditional economics, and I want to argue that we shouldn't forget them uh, because uh, uh, they are probably the most uh, important source of non-compliance. Uh, and the idea behind uh, uh, the first one of these incentives problems is that uh, there uh, may just not be, and here we can start off thinking about what the formal rules are, uh, but there may not be uh, 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 in the formal rules uh, enough positive incentive or negative incentives uh, to produce uh, compliance. So uh, for example, uh, families uh, may believe that uh, child labor, uh, uh, which increases immediate family income, is uh, uh, even though it may uh, lower your uh, child's uh, uh, human capital development and earnings power in the future, uh, you know, we need that income now, or they may believe that, in fact, the investment in education in their children isn't likely to produce uh, an income. So, uh, and, and obviously incentive effects take many different forms. That's just uh, one example. But I want to argue that we shouldn't just think of incentives in terms of formal rules. There are two other things that are absolutely uh, critical to understanding uh, the overall uh, effect of incentives. And a, uh, a second factor is monitoring problems. That you're, it's harder to get high rates of uh, compliance when compliance is difficult or costly to monitor. So think about things like polio vaccinations, where with oral vaccine, there's no mark that's left. Uh, so it's very difficult to make sure that uh, kids have gotten the three to five uh, vaccinations they need to provide uh, uh, immunity. Uh, 
unless you have a good record keeping system uh, in the schools, uh, for example, and you want to get the kids before they get to school. Uh, think about payment of uh, income tax by street vendors. Well, and, you know, in theory, you could have one tax inspector following every street vendor around to make, you know, to get an accurate, uh, uh, you know, indicator of their income, but obviously that would be pretty uh, inefficient, uh, so uh, we don't do that. 